Well, welcome to Henderson First United Methodist Church. What a joy it is to have you worshiping with us uh, both here in the sanctuary and online. Uh, what a joy. I'd like to read a scripture for you from Psalm 81. It says, Hear me, my people, and I will warn you, if you would only listen to me, Israel, you shall have no foreign god among you. You shall not worship any god other than me. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. Open wide your mouth, and I will fill it. We are following the, the people of Israel through the wilderness right now. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a journey of learning how to have faith. And today we're going to be focusing on how to be filled, to be filled with the grace of God. And so let us prepare our hearts as we worship together. And um, Miss Ann Pritchett is going to be our song leader this morning. And so if you would, uh, let us stand. Have our mask on while we sing, but let us stand and give praise to God. Let us pray. Loving Lord, you provide us with days of sweltering heat and cooler days of extraordinary beauty, days we wish we could bottle with their cooling breeze and blue sky, reserving them for whenever we want. Hot days and chilly days, all are your gifts for us to enjoy, O oh Lord. How grateful we are for the life and the loves you have given us. We continue our tedious precautions in the face of the COVID virus, doing so with your grace, O oh God. We remain unsettled by the strangeness of our situation, being so careful, so distant, so masked, we yearn for the days of generous hugs and worry-free activities. We pray for our little children who are not only vulnerable physically, but fragile emotionally in the face of masked people and guarded encounters. We pray for the common good of our nation and our world as we all make our way through the strange. We pray for the healing of the growing number of infected brothers and sisters. May politics be set aside for once and let states and cities be in harmony in combating the virus. And in the end, may our nation come out stronger and purer and your churches find a new vitality and renewed determination to make disciples for Christ. As our scripture this morning will reveal the historical fickle pattern of things getting tough 
followed by our wishing we had stayed home, we will read. When your people Israel joined, journeyed from Egyptian slavery to freedom and things got rough along the way, they began wishing they had never set out beyond their familiar enslavement. It's like our wearing masks and distance, distancing ourselves. At times, it, it doesn't seem worth it. We get tired of crossing the desert masked and, and want to say fooey to the whole mess. That is, until we or someone we love becomes infected. When we want to pout about our, our circumstances, Invite us to look around and see the ways you have fed us and continue to feed us in body, mind, and spirit. So we ask, feed us, O Lord. We are grateful to have Pastor Jim and, and Pam safely back from their vacation, and may you sustain their refreshed spirits. Our community of faith prays for Rick Motter as he has surgery tomorrow. And we continue our prayers for Herb and Cass McKee's daughter, Catherine, as she continues her treatments in Louisville. We take a moment and silence ourselves as we pray for those who are of concern to us personally. As we pray, we remember how Jesus taught us to pray when he prayed, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, children, whether you are here in the sanctuary and you can perk up and listen, we are not quite ready to have you come downstairs yet, but we hope that you'll get that opportunity soon. But today, I want to talk to you a little bit about something that um, sometimes we forget to do. When someone gives you something that is nice and you appreciate it, what do you say to them? What do you say? Thank you. That's right. You say thank you, don't you, when people do nice things for you. But you know, God has given us so much. If we counted all the blessings that God gave us and we were thankful for every one, it would go on and on and on and on. Well, a little bit later, you're going to hear Pastor Jim talk about how the Israelites started doing complaining instead of thanking and we don't want to be like them. We want to, fall, to love God and tell him thank you for the things he does for us. So I'm inviting you to find a jar or maybe a food container that you put leftovers in or something, and that can be your thank you jar. And I want you to start writing thank you notes to people like, thank you, Mom, for helping me with something, or whatever you want to put, or you can draw a picture and put it in there, and then this afternoon, we're having a drive-through ice cream party from six to seven, and we want you to come by under the portico, and we're gonna have some ice cream for you, and um, some of the church staff will be there, Miss Stacy uh, and Miss, um, why am I forgetting her name? Sarah, of course, and Miss Teresa, who do the children's ministry, are going to be there. They want to see you all. They've missed you. So we hope you'll come by, and if you've made your little container, then bring it so that I can get to see what you're already ready for that. But you know, God loves to hear our praises and our thanks, and we want to be able to let him know how much we love and appreciate him. He's given us a home. We have food to eat. 
We have people who love us and take care of us, and we're glad for all that, so we tell him thanks. <clears throat> so let's pray now and ask his help for when we might get grumpy. Dear God, we thank you for all the things you've given us, and we ask that you would help us to always be grateful and not get angry and grumpy and just kind of insist on our own way and gripe and complain. We know that you like us to have an attitude of gratitude and thankfulness for things. So help us to remember to thank you every day for everything that you've given to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I hope to see you this afternoon between 6 and 7. Thank you so much, Ann, for sharing with us. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 16, verses 1 through 5. Let us hear this word from the Lord. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, 
There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food that we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring, bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, before we get started into the message, I just want to say thank you for all those who helped to keep the church going while I was away. Uh, Ray Nix, who preached for me a couple of weeks ago, and Cindy last week. Uh, it was a joy to be able to, to uh, join in over the Internet, and uh, as best I could anyway with where we, where we were at. We had one, one place of the Internet connection was uh, kind of slow. But that having been said, I uh, just can't say enough in terms of uh, how grateful I am for leadership, not only with them, but with so many others that kept the church uh, going along. And we had a fantastic time uh, going out west to a wedding in Montana and doing a little sightseeing along the way. And uh, when I came back, I went to get tested. I just wanted to make absolutely sure. We, we masked up everywhere we went and kept our distance. Um, but uh, the test came back, and I'm clean of the virus, so I'm, I'm thankful for that. Well, you know, I think Snickers Candy Bar has had one of the great advertising campaigns of all time. Uh, it says very simply, you're not you when you're hungry. You're not you when you're hungry. Of course, you've seen the commercials where these people get transformed into these... these uh, these grouchy individuals. It was just a couple of years ago that Oxford Dictionary actually added a new word to its lexicon, hangry, hangry. You know, it's a combination of the word hungry and angry. Uh, do you ever get hangry? You know, I have to confess, I do. I'm ashamed to say so, but, but I, I, I'm vulnerable to that. Well, getting hangry is what happens when an empty stomach sours the attitude. We get grumpy, irritable, impatient, rude. Getting hangry is exactly what was happening with the Hebrews out in that hot, dry desert when food was in short supply. Now, today, we're picking back up on a series that we're looking at throughout the summer months. It's the journey of the Israelites through the wilderness from when they got released in Egypt to when they get to the Promised Land. It's really a series of lessons on how to develop our faith. And you might recall back at the beginning, about a month ago now, that when the Israelites left Egypt, they took unleavened bread with them. They were in such a hurry it, they didn't have time to give uh, the bread a chance to rise. And so they took with them unleavened bread, but that food was now gone. And so, and so naturally they began to wonder, where will our next meal come from? And, and, and I, you know, if, if I were honest, I'd be wondering the same thing if I were in their shoes or sandals, as the case might be. But they didn't just wonder, they began to worry about it, and eventually that worry became anger as the hunger pangs started to set in. They became irritable and blamed Aaron and Moses for their situation. As would become a pattern, the Israelites began whining in the wilderness once again just like they had on the western shores of the Red Sea when they first escaped Egypt. If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you, you have brought us out into this desert to starve us to death. <laughs> 
You know, everything's a crisis when you're hangry. Now, on the surface, this story might appear to be about the challenge of physical hunger, but at a deeper level, it's really about another kind of hunger, a spiritual hunger that we all wrestle with at one time or another. Just as with physical hunger, spiritual hunger can leave us feeling hangry. But instead of being that pain being in our stomachs, that the hunger pangs that we deal with in spiritual hunger are deep within our souls. Many times we might not even realize, you know, it's kind of like when we are physically hangry, it just kind of creeps up on us. And many times we might not even know why we feel the way we do, but it all goes back to the fact that we're spiritually starved. Today's story points out how growing in our faith enables us to satisfy our spiritual hungers. How can we move beyond being spiritually hangry? That's the question. Uh, Bowman, if you wouldn't mind, pull that, pull that slide up. I appreciate it. How can we move beyond being spiritually hangry? Four ways to develop a faith that fills our souls. I want to go over those points this morning. First of all, know that you have a loving God who cares about your hunger. Notice in today's story that God responds to the hunger of his people with great grace. The Israelites, like a bunch of infants crying for milk, are screaming for food here. It's so irritating when that happens, isn't it? You've been around a baby that's, that's hungry and is demanding his or her, her food right now. I think God designed babies to scream in such a way that it, it does irritate. But a loving parent doesn't get mad because their child is hungry. And likewise, we find that God understands their need. God doesn't reprimand them at this point. Like a loving parent, God is patient. Even though some of the people are young and others old, quite frankly, they're all infants at this point when it comes to the development of their faith in the Lord. God understands. God understands that they need to learn, that they need to learn to trust. These first few experiences that we are finding here in the wilderness, well, these are just the first challenges that these people are facing and learning how to have faith. God is like a parent holding the child, the, the, the hands of a toddler who's, who's trying to take that first step. God isn't distressed by their whining. Instead, God is hoping, hoping that they will begin to learn to trust his ability to provide. Despite their foul, angry attitudes, God still loves them. It's, it's kind of like the, the card that a wife gave to her husband one Valentine's Day that says, thank you for loving me even when I'm hangry. God the Father loves his children even when they're spiritually hangry, feeling grumpy and complaining for the simple reason their faith is incomplete. In fact, God isn't just patient with those who feel hungry. Uh, as we dig further into the scriptures, we find that God actually wishes to bless our experiences of hunger. Did you realize that? Matthew 5, 6, listen to what Jesus says in the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what is right. Like I said, the real hunger God is attempting to address in today's story isn't as much about physical hunger as it is spiritual hunger, a hunger that exists deep in our souls to be right in our attitudes, our actions, and our relationships. And I'm not talking about self-righteousness here. No, not at all, but a humble righteousness the kind of righteousness that comes when we sincerely long to be in a re right relationship with the Lord and to do what is right in God's eyes, the kind of righteousness that's saturated with the magnificent love of God. 
We have a loving God who loves to satisfy the hunger pangs as we, that we feel deep within our souls for him. That's the first lesson in developing a faith that feeds us this morning, which leads us to the second point. God promises bread from heaven for the hungry. Then the Lord said to Moses, verse 4, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. Wow, what a promise. A little later in the story, we're told that they actually call this bread from heaven manna. It, when, they, when they went out in the mornings and would pick it up as the dew dried and the, and the manna was left behind, this bread from heaven is like a crust, a wafer. And, and when they first saw it, they asked the question, what is it? And that's the reason it's called manna is because that literally means, what is it? There was a mystery there. And they wondered how it was God was able to, 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 to provide this bread for them. They wondered what it was. But as we hunger after God and God's righteousness, we might wonder the same thing. How is it God provides bread from heaven for us from here and now? What is it that God can do? And we find the answer over in John chapter 6. Once again, Jesus speaking here. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. You see, as the, the divine Son of God, as the one who is uniquely fully human and fully divine, Jesus is the bread from heaven that offers us life. He uniquely has the ability, you see, to satisfy that which we crave for, to know and experience eternal realities that have lasting and substantive value. We are fed as we relate to him. So much, so much of what the world offers us in terms of experience and entertainment is little more than junk food, folks. What we really need, what we really crave is a relationship with the Lord, a relationship that gives us strength, purpose, direction, and energy in our lives. Knowing that we have a loving God who cares when we're hungry, believing God's promise to provide bread from heaven, the third lesson to developing a faith that feeds us is that we need to eat daily. Eat daily in order to be well-fed. That's our next point. Now notice in today's story, the Israelites were to collect manna, how? Daily, in order to meet their needs. They were to go out every day and collect manna, except for on the day before the Sabbath. And then they were to collect it enough for two days. We'll get back to that in just a moment. But what they collected on most of the days was only good enough for what? For that day. There were those, you know, who thought they would, you know, see if they could get by with maybe going out every other day. Do you know what happened? It, it, it tells us a little bit further down in Exodus 16, verse 20. Some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. It went rotten, folks. 
You see, learning from and following the Lord is something that requ it requires that we do that on a regular basis. We cannot be well fed if we do it just once or twice a year or once or twice a month or even just once or twice a week. It, it, we're only going to get well fed if, if we eat daily. And, and I would dare say that if we were to try to eat only twice a week or once a week, you know, coming to church, and that's our, kind of our spiritual fix, if you will. You know, what if you were to only have one meal a week? I would dare say all of us would be hangry all the time. How can we possibly expect for our bodies to thrive if we ate only one meal a week? You see, a vibrant relationship with the Lord requires that we go to him by reading the scriptures every day to learn of God's ways, to talk to the Lord daily through prayer, looking for God in our daily routines and experiences, meeting with other Christian believers who can encourage and support us in our journeys on a regular basis. We need that to be fed spiritually. John Wesley used to call those the means of grace. There was only one day that the Israelites did not have to collect manna, and that was on the sixth day, or that was on the Sabbath. And on the day before, the sixth day, they could collect, could collect twice as much on that day. Why? Because on the day of the Sabbath, God wanted them to focus on what was going to feed them spiritually in their experience. And that was worship. Miraculously, the manna from the day before would, could and did last for two days. And likewise, when we worship with the larger body of believers, the church family, that's when we feast spiritually. But out of the days in between, we still need to eat. We still need to be nourished. Know that we have a loving God who cares about our hunger. Believe God's promise to provide bread from heaven. Eat daily. The fourth way to develop a nourishing faith comes by believing and following God's instructions. Believing and following God's instructions. After giving the instruction about collecting manna daily, God says this to Moses. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Are they going to follow my instructions? You see, following God's instructions gets to the heart of what it means to have faith. Are we willing to follow through on the guidance that God gives us in his word and what he asks us to do as we pray? It's not just enough to believe what we glean from God's word. We also need to put it into practice. In fact, John 14, Jesus once again speaking, anyone who loves me will, what? Obey my teaching. My father will love them and he and we will come to them and make our home with them. In other words, God comes to inhabit our lives he fills us up with his presence. But you see, it's all in the obedience, the willingness to actually incorporate what Jesus says into our lives. You know, in just a moment, we're going to receive Holy Communion, where we eat the bread that represents the body of Christ and we drink the fruit of the vine, which represents his blood. It's so deeply symbolic and significant. By physically eating these things, and as we, as we physically consume these things, we are saying by faith and practice that we are doing what? That we're incorporating the living Christ into our lives and into our lifestyles. We're making Jesus our source for spiritual nourishment. So I simply ask this morning, are you ready? Are you ready to eat? 
Are you ready to move beyond being hangry, irritable, because you're spiritually starved? Are you ready to believe on the one who can uniquely fill that spiritual hunger that you're feeling inside? Are you ready to be the real you? Going back to that Snickers commercial, you aren't you when you're hungry. Are you ready to be the real you that God made you to be as you consciously receive and incorporate Jesus into your life? Well, if you are, I invite you to prepare yourself. I want to invite Pastor Cindy to come and lead us in our prayer confession that we are in need of God's help in this. As the words come up on the screen, Bowman, for the prayer of confession, we will begin, and you'll read the bold ones. I think it'll be obvious there. Let us pray together a collective prayer of confession. Lord of righteousness and love, you call us to place our trust in you, to seek your will, to follow your wisdom, and to find our peace in you. Yet we confess that we look to ourselves, consumed by selfish pride and desire, we neglect the needs of others and our need to listen to you. Anger fills our streets, complaints permeate our social media posts, and fear saturates our souls. Forgive us, we pray. Cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Come, bread from heaven, and fill us with your divine goodness as we choose to hunger for you and your salvation. Let us now pray our prayers of silent personal confession. Amen. Hear once again the promise from Psalm 81, which says in verses 13 and 16, If my people would only listen to me and follow my ways, you would be fed with the finest of wheat, with honey from the rock I would satisfy you. By the grace of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. By the grace of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Come now and find your fill in the holy meal of Christ Jesus, our Lord. As we prepare, I hope everyone received your uh, Holy Communion uh, packet. Uh, there, the bread is on top. Uh, before we have the great Thanksgiving, you'll find a very thin, transparent piece of plastic you want to pull on that first, and that will open up the wafer on top. And then after we take that, you can open up the, the main part to get to the juice. But let us join together in the great Thanksgiving, and I'd like to invite Bowen, if you could, pull that up so we can all be together. And once again, if you will... Join in on the bold parts as they come up. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. It is, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Oh, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. 
Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to re proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after the supper, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he blessed it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink of this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Drink of this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. And so, O oh God, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. So let us prepare to receive together the body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you that we are united as one body as we have one faith in you. Bread of heaven, bread from heaven that comes to fill our souls even in this sacred moment that we might be filled with your presence, that we might come to know you, the living word that nourishes our souls, that gives direction to the steps of our path that we might live in the midst of your glory. We give you thanks, and we pray your continued blessings through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, let us continue in our worship as we prepare to uh, give our offerings. I got on a roll. We didn't have our next song, so won't we go ahead and sing to beca uh, become to us the living bread.
As we conclude our service, um, I would like to share with you our final act of worship and let you know about a couple of other things. Sorry, it doesn't like to cooperate. I think I'm all tangled up. But anyway, when you leave the sanctuary, uh, there is an urn back there for you to put your communion element packaging in, and there's also an offering plate back there because as a final act of worship, after God has blessed us so much, we want to give back to God. So you have that opportunity to give there, and there are some ways up on the screen that are explaining how you can give in other ways if you are... Um, not prepared to give here today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have blessed us so much, and we ask right now, Lord, that you would bless our hearts as we prepare to go out into the world, that you would strengthen us and help us to live life as a uh, fervent offering of ourselves to you. We thank you for the homes we enjoy, for the clothes we have to wear, for all the ways that you have blessed us. And help us to remember that you have blessed us to be a blessing. May we do that now as we give our tithes and offerings. And may they bring you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I will be glad when we don't have to do this all the time. But isn't it good to be filled? And as you go, may your hangriness have been filled with God's peace, your hunger with God's love, your hunger pains with God's righteousness. Arise and now go in the peace, love, and joy of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.